Uh, Peter, it's Mayor Brown here just testing my microphone. Good. Good morning, Mayor Brown. We can hear you loud and clear. Thank you. Good morning, Peter. It's Councilor Fortini testing. Thank you, Councilor Fortini. We, you're coming through loud and clear. Good morning, Peter. It's Councilor Keenan. Just checking my mic. Good morning, Councilor Keenan. You're coming through loud and clear. Thank you. Good morning, Peter. It's uh, Medeiros. Good morning, Councilor Medeiros. You're coming through loud and clear. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Committee of Council today. As we begin today's meeting, we would like to acknowledge that we are gathering here today on the treaty territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, and before them, the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, Huron, and Wendat. We also acknowledge the many First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and other global indigenous people that now call Brampton their home. We are honored to live, work, and enjoy this land. Before we officially begin today's meeting, I think it's so important for us to take a moment to acknowledge that last week we lost a community hero. And we are all mourning the sudden passing of Brampton Fire and Emergency Services Division Chief of Fire, Life Safety and Education, our friend, our brother, our colleague, Ravjot Chatwell. For those of you who knew him and many of you I know, knew him well, because he was a social butterfly. You would know that he was a larger than life presence at the city of Brampton and across our entire community. Rav will be remembered for his infectious smile, exuding joy and kindness to all he encountered and for his love of community building. He was a leader in championing diversity, equity, and inclusion, and in fact, he was the first turbaned Sikh member of Fire and Emergency Services leadership team in Canada. Rav joined the city in 2013 in strategic communications, and I know that many of our colleagues in STRATCOM were very close to Rav during that time, where he helped lead multicultural media relations and engagement for the city. He then moved to Brampton Fire and Emergency Services team where he helped build a safer and more inclusive fire department and community. Rav was a trailblazer and he was a role model. In 2021, Rav led Brampton Fire and Emergency Services application to receive the Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Award. And I personally remember him telling me with so much excitement all about that application process and being nervous about whether or not Brampton would actually win. It was the first EDI award ever given up, up out by the Canadian Association of Fire Chiefs and Brampton did indeed receive it in 2021. Rav was so proud of Brampton and loved his Brampton fire family. To many of us, we were his family speaking many different languages, including Tagalog or Filipino, to me, he would always greet me with, Kamusta kapatid, which means, how are you, sister? 
and this was usually followed by a joke or trying to make me laugh. And many of you would probably experience or experience the same thing when talking to Rav. He attended almost every single city event, and I will always be grateful to him for attending our very first lorry at the Gudwara this past January, where, as always, he sat this behind myself and Councillor Vicente, proud to be there with us in the community. The last time I personally saw Rav was on International Women's Day on March the 8th at the Zonta Breakfast, where he took countless photos of Deputy Chief Kim Kane and myself and fellow panelists on the stage who spoke about embracing equity. And we managed that morning to get Rav in the photo after a numerous demands of telling Rav to get in the picture. We will not be able to replace him in our Brampton family and his impact goes well beyond the call of duty. And I'm hoping that Chief, you can come back with some ideas on how we may best commemorate our cupboted, our brother, Rav Chatwal, at the city of Brampton. Later this evening, his family invites those who can pay their respects to do so at the Brampton Crematorium and Visitation Center this afternoon from 3 to 5 p.m. Rav's heart and spirit was larger than life. As chair of Brampton Fire and Community and, and Emergency Services, I invite all to keep his memory alive and rem remember the happy, kind soul that he was. I'll now ask members of council or senior staff if they wanted to share a few words about our brother Rav to do so at this time. Councillor Santos, if I may, Chair Santos. Yes, go ahead. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And yes, it's uh, when I heard of the news of Rav Judge passing, um, I was uh, very sad to hear about it. Uh, I knew Ravjot uh, not only as uh, our deputy fire chief, but also um, as a brother, as a fellow member uh, on the board of the Carebram uh, Multicultural Festival. Uh, I served together with Ravjot on the board of Carebram uh, for several years. And as you said, Madam Chair, uh, at every function, and in every place where Rav Jot was, he brought joy and a, and a zeal, a, a zest for life uh, that uh, no one could compare and do the same as he did. Uh, wherever, whoever he met, whomever he spoke to, he left them feeling happier and happy to be alive, happy to be part of building Brampton and, and making Brampton a better place for everybody. Uh, as you mentioned, Madam Chair, he, he spoke multiple languages and I will uh, attest to his knowledge of speaking Portuguese. He would always greet you with uh, como está and obrigado at the end of uh, any encounter. And he would... Um, make efforts to say as much as he could in Portuguese when he spoke to myself or to other folks who were also Portuguese. And um, we're going to miss him. He will. He is irreplaceable. And we will not see someone like him again. And uh, I think that Brampton has lost a really, really... Um, important part of our community and uh, we are all a little bit less now that Ravjad is no longer in our lives. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Vicente. Chief Boyce. Uh, through the Chair, I, I just want to um, Acknowledge first, today's a, a really hard day, and last week's been really tough on the team, not only in fire, but uh, across the city and, and even in the community. Just to, his presence and his impact um, is almost immeasurable. And to see what he did as a trailblazer, a role model, um, and, and really helping to transform the fire service, not just in Brampton, but um, throughout Canada, 
and uh, it's you know it's so important that later on today we're going to get to honor Rev. We're going to get to remember him and be there to support his family. And uh, I did have a chance uh, this week and over the last few days to speak with his family, and they're very appreciative. Uh, to everyone in the community, including all uh, uh, mayor and council and all the remarks and all the city staff that have reached out uh, either online or to them, and, and they do appreciate it. And we understand they're going through a, a tough time, and we will certainly come back and uh, find a way to honor his legacy because I think he's going to leave an incredible legacy um, in the city, um, in the community, and in the fire service. So we're, we're just very proud, uh, me personally, uh, to call Rav a friend and to work alongside him as a chief officer. Uh, and we're going to really, truly miss him. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Mayor Brown? Yes, thank you, Chair Santos. And um, just to echo the words of Councillor Vasante, yourself, and Chief Boyce, um, an immeasurable loss that really words do not do justice to. Uh, you try to pick the words to explain what he meant to the city, but they all come up uh, as inadequate. Um, and he really had a smile on his face at every event. And whether it was a flag raising or a charity event, he just showed up for Brampton again and again and again. And if you look at the messages that we've been inundated by on Facebook or email or social other social media platforms, there was a love for Rav Jot. You know, he, he touched um, the city in, in a very um, moving way. You know, I was just listening to the tribute in the House of Commons that our one of our local MPs, Shafkat Ali, gave, and it was and it was beautiful. Uh, but at every level of government, for you know, every charity across the city, from every part of our mosaic, uh, um, you know, he was someone that showed up for all of us. And so, uh, I'm very glad that Chief Boys is looking at ways to honor that legacy. I think it's uh, appropriate to celebrate role models like him, who did so much in, in his short life. And I look forward to supporting that initiative when the chief brings it back to us to to honor his beautiful legacy. He was a gift to the city of Brampton, and he will be missed uh, for a very long time. Thank you, Mayor Brown. Councillor Tor. Uh, this is a personal one, and it's difficult to find uh, words to speak about, Rav. Uh, when I first got the email from Chief, uh, I read that email so many times because I couldn't believe that this is real, like this is what we're reading. Um, it is very difficult to see, even see him up on the screen here and that you know, this is actually happening, that we're actually talking about Rav um, in his memory, in his absence. Um, you know, over the last week, uh, so many people reached out, so many people um, reached out that I didn't expect Rav to know, but um, how foolish of me, because Rav knew everybody not just here at the city of Brampton, but across the city, and he touched so many lives. Uh, so many organizations, not-for-profit not organizations, um, reached out uh, that Rav helped them out at some point. Um, you know, we, were, um, we were on a tour of Sheridan College the other day, and college staff at Sheridan College were telling us how involved he was um, in, in making sure that you know, international students at Sheridan College were getting the support that they needed. Um, Rav was, he was always shy about that and, and I think that Dave could attest to that, it's hard to find pictures of Rav because he, he, he was never the person to be in front and say that, you know, I'm the champion for this. He quietly did a lot of the work and, and we get to see that now with the amount of messages that we have received across the city. Um, I just want to offer my condolences uh, to his family, uh, to all his friends, to everybody that knew Rav. Uh, he was one of my first friends, I would say, at City Hall when I started here in 2014. He was the only person in the building with a turban um, for someone like me to come here. And, and he stood out to me right away. Um, I could see him. I, can, I said, I'm going to go talk to this guy because he looks like me. It made it very easy. Um, and then Rav was proud to see me come back again. And, and we had so many chats and we were you know, meant to catch up and, and talk about things. Um, and he said that, you know, look around. Uh, now we see a lot more of us, you know, a lot more people with turbans uh, around in, in, the, in the city building. And Rao was a tra trailblazer in uh, every regard. Again, at, at, you know, at fire and, and being the first person of this kind um, at any fire division across the city. So um, 
uh, you know, I echo the same comments that Chief at an appropriate time when we are able to find, uh, if you guys can report back on it, uh, when we're able to find a, a nice way to memorialize Rav and, and what he meant to the city. Um, that would be appreciated. And uh, it's, it's also heartwarming to see uh, during this week, um, you know, in corridors, you see staff walking past each other. Saw a lot of hugs being exchanged. Um, staff that that knew Rav and, and, and staff came together in this difficult time, um, and especially calm staff. So my condolences to everybody that uh, knew Rav, worked alongside with them at uh, you know strategic communications at uh, and at Brentwood Fire, and um, I hope to see as many of you as possible at uh, the service later today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Tour. Um, I realize that this is a very difficult topic and um, difficult for all of us to have this set in that somebody so important that everyone loved across the city uh, has left us. And so I think the, um, the silence on, on Council right now is because many of us don't have anything further to say and it's really difficult um, to actually accept this at the present moment in time. So I would ask if you're able to, to please rise for a moment of silence and personal reflection in memory of Rav Chat Chatwal. So good morning everyone and welcome to our meeting of Brampton's Committee of Council. All members are present today with the following um, who are not here, uh, sitting in their seats present remotely and virtually and the clerk has made note that we do have everyone in attendance today. Our next item is approval of the agenda. Do any members wish to add a business item to today's meeting? If you do, please raise your hand virtually or put your name on the board. I see none at this time. I do have a couple of amendments to the agenda with respect to order. Oh, I have Mayor Brown. Mayor Brown, go ahead. Not sure if this is the time, but uh, I would note um, the ward boundary re review, I was going to suggest we defer until after the regional review is over in case it uh, creates any unnecessary uh, work. Okay, so there's a recommendation to uh, defer for the regional review report until after the provincial review. That is one possible amendment. Councillor Pileshi followed by Councillor Singh. Sorry, through, through you, Chair Santos. If a deferral motion is moved, it's put to a vote immediately. I see, okay. Is this the, the uh, Mayor Brown, do you wish to still uh, introduce your deferral? Uh, yes, unless there's anyone else who wants to speak to and I can hold. I believe Councillor Pileshi wanted to speak to this item. Okay, I'll wait to put the deferral on there. So he's, he's standing down his motion okay. and to allow okay. it to be. Okay, so the deferred. deferral motion has been stood down. Councillor Pileshi, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm happy to support some kind of deferral to next council. I think we should have the discussion and I don't think we should be deferring it until after the, the province does whatever um, regional review they're doing. I think we should at least have a discussion, whether that's here tonight, and then talk about any type of deferral, or defer it until until next week, um, so that we can at least have uh, have the discussion around this table. Okay. So there's now a referral motion by Councillor Pileshi to have the discussion about this report at the next council meeting. Correct. Okay. So there's a referral of this particular item for the next council meeting, which is next week. Mayor Brown, go ahead. 
Yeah, I'm fine with that. Okay, and Councillor Vicente, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. As both myself and Councillor Keenan are remote today, there is a discussion item in the Public Works and Engineering section. I'm asking if uh, Deputy Mayor Singh can chair that section as part of, uh, as he completes corporate services section. Okay, thank you very much for that suggestion. Councillor, or Deputy Mayor Singh, are you okay with that for Public Works section? Thank you. And Councillor Singh, go ahead. Um, I'd like to place a deferral motion on 10.2.6. Uh, we had some issues with third party advertisers. I just want to dot our I's and cross our T's. Okay, so there's a deferral of 10.2.6, which will go to next committee, next committee of council. And this is an annual external, or sorry, what is 10.2.6? Digital bur uh, billboard procurement. Yeah. Okay, so we'll take that vote now. All those in favor to defer 10.2.6 to the next committee of council meeting. All those in favor, any opposed, that carries. Thank you, Councillor Singh. Uh, if there's no one else on the board, just one additional amendment to the order of the agenda today. I know that Chief Boys has to be at the f funeral for preparations today by one o'clock. Um, is my understanding, so we will move community services um, after government relations. Uh, and then I know that for public works, we have members of the public who are attending today regarding one particular report. So we will move public works immediately following community services and then proceed with the rest of the agenda with legislative services and Vice Chair Pileshi will be chairing that section. Mr. Clerk, do you have those amendments? Wonderful. That is the agenda for today, including amendments. All those in favor, anyone opposed, that carries. Thank you very much, everyone. The next one is declarations of conflict of interest regarding the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act. Do any members on council have any declarations of conflict of interest for today's meeting? Mayor Patrick Brown, your hand is still up. Can somebody put that down? I'm assuming that's from before, perfect. So there are no declarations of conflict of interest for this meeting and the clerk will so note. The next item is consent. As part of the consent motion process, I will read out each agenda item subject to the consent motion and any member may verbally identify the item to be held for debate during the meeting. Any item not held for debate will be considered as part of the consent motion and voted on for approval. I'll start reading now. 8.1.1 .1 is held for a staff presentation. 8.2.1 is held for a staff, staff presentation. 8.2.2, staff report regarding proactive property standards, exterior enforcement. I'd like to hold that one as it relates to the other report and motion coming forward. 8.2.3, staff report amendment to Schedule A of the AMPS non parfic non-parking bylaw, supportive housing residences and additional residential unit res registration. That's in consent. <coughs> Staff report housekeeping amendment to Schedule A of administrative penalties bylaw 2018-2019 licensing bylaw changes. Consent. Oh, hold by Councillor Pileshi. 8.2.5 staff report annual report on the access to information and protection of privacy program for 2022. I'm holding that one. 8.2.6 staff report ward boundary review process. That is referred to council next week. 10.1.1 held for a staff presentation. 10.1.2 uh, staff presentation as well. 10.2.1 staff report bylaw to establish tax ratios for 2023. Consent. 10.2.2 staff report purchasing activity quarterly report fourth quarter. Consent. 10.2.3 staff report active consulting service contracts Q4 2022. Consent. 10.2.4 staff report annual statement of remuneration and expenses for 2022. Consent. 10.2.5 is held for a staff presentation. 10.2.6 has been deferred to next committee of council. Uh, 10.2.7, staff report salary administration policy minor revision. Consent. 10.2.8, held for staff presentation. 10.3.1, minutes accessibility advisory committee March 7th. Consent. 
11.3.1 is being held for discussion item. 11.4.1 uh, held for a discussion item. 12.2.1 staff report amendment to administrative authority bylaw execution of performing arts agreement. Consent. 12.2.2 staff report preferred site for William G. Davis Memorial Sculpture. I'm holding that one. 12.2.3 staff report regarding budget amendment for Torbram Sandalwood Adventure Park Federal Grant Funding Ward 10. Consent. Beautiful park. 12.3.1 uh, minutes, Branson Senior Citizens Council, February 7th, 2023, in consent. 12.3.2 minutes, Branson Sports Hall of Fame Committee, consent. And 15.1 open meeting exception under 2392C and K of the Municipal Act 2001, a proposed or pending acquisition or disposition of land by the municipality or local board. Anyone to hold that one? That is in consent. The clerk will now summarize the items held by members for their consideration or not part of the consent motion prior to approval of this motion. Mr. Clerk, over to you. Through you, Chair Santos, uh, the items held, uh, aside from those that were mentioned for staff presentations or discussion items, 8.2.2, a staff report on proactive property standards exterior enforcement held by Chair Santos. 8.2.4, a staff report on housekeeping amendment to Schedule A of the Administrative Penalties Bylaw 2018. 2019, excuse me, 218, 2019, licensing bylaw charges uh, held by Councillor Pileshi. 8.2.5, a staff report on the annual report on the access to information and protection of privacy program for 2022, held by Chair Santos. And 12.2.2, uh, a staff report on the preferred site for the William G. Davis Memorial Sculpture held by Chair Santos, with the balance either already held or to be considered as part of the consent motion. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Motion moved by Councillor Pileshi to approve the consent motion. All those in favor, anyone opposed, that motion carries. Next item of the agenda is uh, announcements. Item number 5.1, an announcement regarding the economic development annual report release. Joining us today is Claire Barnett, Director of Economic Development and Regional Councillor Tour, Chair Tour, is the sponsor for this announcement. Welcome, Claire. Good morning, uh, Mayor Brown, members of Council. This is a great day for economic development in the city of Brampton. I'm very pleased to announce the release of our 2022 annual report. It shows a year of resilience in our economy. It shows a year of growth, incredible anchor investments, which were some of the largest in the country and the most impactful. Our team really helped businesses create thousands of jobs. We grew and scaled the innovation district. We supported thousands of entrepreneurs and small businesses through our entrepreneur center. I am very pleased to thank the team that's here today from Economic Development. I'd like to thank our colleagues from across the city who support Economic Development every day in their work. And I'd certainly like to thank our communications colleagues for all the work that they did putting into the uh, report itself. I'm very proud to deliver to you an award-winning and accredited Economic Development Department that will continue to deliver great work. We've already had a great start to 2013, and I look forward to working with uh, Councillor Tour as well on that. And of course, Councillor Santos, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Deputy Mayor Singh. Thank you. I just want to recognize uh, Claire and the team as well. Um, I've had a pleasure working with you and your staff, especially as we um, finalize the MedTech Task Force as well. So it's been enjoyable. The only request I would have is if it, it's a beautiful um, deck, if we could just have one or two shareables we could share just to let residents know, because I could speak for words nine and 10, and I know uh, yeah, Chair Tour will also attest to is the fact that um, this is one of the biggest issues of words nine and 10. So just a couple of shareables we could just share, uh, and, and for our residents, um, they hear things, but I just think just the easy digestible shareable would make a big difference. Outside of that, thank you for everything you do. Thank you so much, Deputy Mayor Singh, and thank you so much, Claire, and our economic, economic development team for the incredible work in this annual report. Um, next, we have public delegations, and each delegation has a total of five minutes per delegation, and there will be a warning, uh, one-minute warning from the clerk. 
um, when we're close to the end of the five minutes. Today we have item 6.1, a delegation from Algoma University regarding Algoma University downtown footprint expansion update. And joining us today is Asma Vizina, President and Vice Chancellor. Welcome, it's lovely to see you. Should we also have Shannon Brooks. Uh, no, we have Craig Fowler. We have Craig Fowler, <laughs> Vice President of Growth and External Relations. Thank you, Asma and Craig, for joining us, and welcome. You have five minutes. Thank you, Chair Santos. And I do have a video that will cause me to go over, I believe, so I'm probably going to ask for a couple of extra minutes. Uh, but good morning, Your Worship, uh, Mayor Brown, Chair Santos, and Councillors. It's wonderful to be here with you today. And uh, again, thank you for the opportunity to provide a brief update on the continued expansion of Algoma University in Brampton's downtown. Today I want to focus the presentation on furthering our commitment to Brampton's development of the Innovation District and to again confirm Algoma University's interest in securing an anchor tenancy in the Centre for Innovation, the CFI building. We continue to expand our downtown campus footprint, which currently sits at 100,000 square feet with the goal of securing an additional 265,000 square feet to accommodate 5,000 students. I go to the next slide. At a high level, Algoma's efforts in Brampton can be described as committed, future-focused, passionate, and ambitious. We are working hard as a university to align with the City of Brampton's goals and priorities, and we are currently signing many partnership agreements and collaborations to assist us in doing that. In slide three, please. We are committed to supporting Brampton's aspirations to situate itself as a key player in the innovation corridor. We are committed to being a main tenant in the CFI building and will focus on research and development through company and industry partnerships, supporting integrated strategies and solutions that foster the development of thriving innovation systems in the attraction of entrepreneurs, startups, and business incubators. Our School of Computer Science and Technology is committed to providing a direct pipeline of talent into the ecosystem through undergraduate, graduate programming, and through partnerships with companies like Amuka and others. Algoma will provide upskilling and reskilling to the workforce through partnership with the largest player in the ARVR sector, Unity Technologies, and are in the process of building the National Centre of Training Excellence with Unity. Slide four. As a main tenant in the CFI building, we would propose to centralize and deliver our new advanced technology and computer science programming, including a new master's in computer science, as well as research in this facility. Programming covers areas of cybersecurity, robotics, artificial intelligence, and other, uh, other industries located in the location. I want to just take this moment to show you a video from Unity um, that speaks a little bit to the, the quality and the caliber of partners that Algoma is attracting. So, uh, through you, Chair Santos, I'm just going to share the video. You should be able to just click. It, it wasn't tested prior to the meeting. That's why I'll, I'll be able to play it here. So while, while um, they're putting the video on, just to speak a little bit about Unity. So we are actually um, visiting Abu Dhabi uh, in a few weeks. The city of Brampton will be joining us, some of the uh, um, representatives from uh, Economic Impact, and we're hoping Mayor Brown can also join us as part of his trip to Pakistan. And so this will give you just a sense of uh, what a national center with Unity Technologies is. <laughs> Yeah, I hope so. You'll feel it right away. The intimate, close-knit connections. Here, academic excellence is personal. Small seminars, hands-on. Oh, it's not the right video. Okay, so we'll, um, we'll show you the video at another time. Um, but I do also want to speak a little bit uh, in slide seven, just to uh, a little bit of uh, some of the other things that we're doing. 
Um, and I actually had um, a good meeting with uh, Councillor Santos a couple of weeks ago to speak about the Ontario Mental Health and Addictions Research and Training Institute. So this is a second uh, fairly significant institute uh, initiative that Algoma University is taking on right now. Uh, we have secured space for the Institute and it will be part of the commitment that we're making to health science programming. It'll be a nice uh, tie into the School of Medicine as well. Uh, what we see the Institute focusing on is new programming to support the mental health and addictions crisis that's plaguing so many in our country and emerging a body of research and evidence-based practice that will train a new generation of mental health professionals. Uh, we'll be looking at certifications, diplomas, degrees, masters and PhD programming and partnerships with universities, colleges and indigenous institutes. The idea is a holistic approach that purposely integrates the best of Western science with cross-cultural teachings including black, South Asian and indigenous knowledge and understanding. Next slide please, and this is my last slide. Uh, we are earnestly preparing for future growth of up to 7,500 students currently. The only reason for delay would be space availability. We've done a master plan uh, that we're working on in development with the downtown of the Brampton campus. We require, as I mentioned earlier, an additional 265,000 square feet immediately. Uh, we are securing space outside of the city of Brampton to deal with the pressure points of the enrollment growth, but we're also working very closely with uh, Marlon and some of the folks at the city to try to find um, it, more space in Brampton's downtown. We are very anxious to get a response on the CFI building as we have to do a long-term space strategy for the university. We're also um, requesting a discussion around Central Public School, uh, Theatre Lane, the current library building once it's vacated, and we are in conversation uh, around 2021 Nelson as a, a potential site for an additional student residence. Um, if you go to slide nine, just want to reiterate that we uh, have a tender coming out in, um, for a new residence uh, for the downtown of Brampton. It'll see about 350 to 400 uh, student beds. Uh, which will house the uh, demographic of 5,000 students. So I understand uh, in looking at the package today that a formal request for proposals will be coming for the CFI anchor, anchor tenancy in the future. I look forward to submitting a proposal. Happy to discuss any aspect of our presentation and answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Asma. I'm just going to check and see if we have any questions online at this time. I don't think that we do. I'm a couple of questions uh, from myself, and I think it's great that the Mental Health and Addictions Research and Training Institute um, is something Algoma is, is championing. How have the conversations with the province been on that one? Very good. I mean, we've made a number of presentations through the budgeting process. Um, we've had um, meetings with several MPPs. Uh, we are in discussions with um, the folks that are leading the mental health um, uh, priorities for the ministry. So uh, lots of positive response. We haven't made a large ask to the province yet, um, but that's coming. Thank you. And I know that there's some more funding um, that was announced even federal, from the federal government as well as the provincial government yeah. for mental health and addictions. And um, the city of Brampton, together with the Peel District School Board, have been working on a number of things related to youth mental health. Um, we've always been chronically underfunded, so the timing on this would be wonderful. Um, and, and my team knows that we're trying to help connect you with members of the community um, who do work in this field. Um, any further questions for Councillor Tour? Just a comment, got to do the tour yesterday, so thank you uh, so much for that. Just want to acknowledge uh, Something that you prou proudly uh, showed off yesterday was the new logo uh, where you have Brampton Algoma University and, and it's not, Brampton's not two words aside, it's not a asterisk, yeah. it's not somewhere hidden, it's as big as uh, the rest of the university name. So it's really good to see that because uh, I think it symbolizes that change uh, that you know, we were discussing of Algoma just being located in Brampton versus being part of uh, Brampton. I think that really symbolizes that. So I just want to acknowledge that change and we welcome that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tor. And on that note, when I saw it, it was very exciting to see and look at, as Craig knows and as, as you know when, when you saw my reaction on that one. And I just also wanted to acknowledge the p partnership um, and the relationship that we have with Algoma U. I have to say, um, 
that it's been a very positive one right from the very, very beginning, since the beginning of last term. So thank you, Ozma, for your leadership and the level and quality of um, professionalism that you bring to the table working with the city. Thank you. Motion to receive the delegation from Councillor Tour. All those in favor? Anyone opposed? That carries. Thank you so much for thank the delegation you. and update. Next item of the agenda is government relations matters. We have uh, Chris Ethier, CAO's office, with a presentation for committee on government relations matters and a lot of things going on with various budgets that have happened over the past couple of weeks. So, Chris, welcome, and we look forward to your update. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning, Council. Um, through you, Chair. Um, next slide, please. Sorry. Uh, this week, there are no regional council or committee meetings, so the next regional council meeting is scheduled for Thursday, April 13th at 9.30 a.m. Next slide, please. In provincial updates, uh, we focus on the 2023 Ontario budget presented by the Minister of Finance on Thursday, March 23rd. While members of council received a briefing note with the initial analysis of the budget, staff continued to review the document to inform our advocacy work. The budget included several wins for Brampton, including $4 million to support the Innovation District and Beehive to help attract more entrepreneurs and business investment. Other highlights directly relevant to, the, to Brampton include more payment options for transit users to pay fares on Presto device, including with credit cards, smartphones, or smartwatches removal of double transit fares. It's a work in progress, but this means that after transit users pay their fare for a go bus or train, they do not pay again when accessing Brampton Transit. There is also funding for development of a purpose-built facility in the region of Peel to provide a full continuum of care for first responders experiencing post-traumatic stress injury and other concurrent mental health disorders. And while the budget also includes largely already announced investments in infrastructure, it does reaffirm the provincial commitment towards transformation of Peel Memorial Centre into a new 24-7 inpatient care hospital. The following, budget, following the budget presentation, we also learned about the introduction of regular weekend GO train service between Mount Pleasant Station in Brampton and Union Station beginning April 8th. This past Monday, the Premier also announced $3 million in provincial funding for the GT20 Cricket Tournament this summer in Brampton. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide just provides a, a high-level fiscal overview of the budget, including the projected surplus by 2025-2026. Next slide, please. This slide provides some details from the budget. I won't go through everything, but I would point out that while it's largely a regional responsibility, uh, the budget does include an additional $202 million each year in the Homelessness Prevention Program and Indigenous Supportive Housing Program to help provide long -term, local long-term housing solutions and support services for people experiencing or risk of homeless, or at risk of homelessness. This aligns well with the motion that Council passed just a few weeks ago um, in support of AMO, uh, calling on the province to take action on homelessness. There's also $425 million over three years for mental health and addiction services and additional funding for health care and home care. The province continues investing in skills development through the $224 million investment in a new capital stream of the skills development fund. As mentioned, our team continues to analyze the budget to better identify opportunities for the city and strengthen our advocacy work. Next slide, please. In federal updates, um, we, we saw a significant announcement from the federal government with the launch of the $4 billion Housing Accelerator Fund. This fund is intended to help local governments to fast track the creation of 100,000 new homes across the country. Local governments are invited to develop innovative action plans in line with flexible criteria to remove barriers to building more homes faster by thinking big and being innovative in their approaches. Application portal for the Housing Accelerator Fund will open this June and city staff will be working with uh, the Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation over the coming weeks on this important fund. Next slide, please. 
The federal budget 2023 was tabled late yesterday, um, which is why we're unable to capture it in great detail in this presentation. We will provide a, a more detailed budget overview in the next GR presentation. In the meantime, council members were provided with a briefing note containing highlights from the budget and initial comments. As the government rolls out the individual initiatives from the budget, we will conduct a detailed analysis of the document and work to identify any potential opportunities for funding and partnerships. The budget was built on three themes, making life more affordable, stronger public health and dental care, and growing a green economy. It includes the recently announced funding, um, funding increased outlined in the federal provincial health care agreements, a new Canadian dental care plan, while including a new federal toolkit for investing in the clean economy, a set of clear and predictable investment tax credits, low cost strategic financing, and targeted investments and programming where necessary to respond to the unique needs of sectors or projects deemed in, in the national e economic significance. The budget also introduces new spending in a range of areas that may impact the city and our community, including a reallocation of funds to support the building of affordable housing, $108 million to support community events, $50 million to expand the community's at-risk security infrastructure program and measures that will lower credit card transaction fees for our small businesses. As I mentioned, we will have a more detailed outline of the budget as part of the next presentation. Prior to the budget, Minister Kara announced $1 million in funding to Indus Community Services to support a project focused on mental health for youth in the region of Peel South Asian communities. I also want to highlight an announcement on Monday by MP Sonia Sidhu, uh, highlighting the success of the My Main Street projects in Brampton. As businesses in six Main Street communities receive funding to strengthen their businesses and their connections to customers with a combined investment of $945,000. The federal government also announced new funding for community infrastructure with three projects in South Brampton totaling $1.6 million. These projects are the Community Kitchen, which received $522,000, um, expanded and rebuilt Brampton Tennis Club Clubhouse at Rosalie Park, um, which received approximately $750,000, and the purchase and installation of a Brampton Tourism sign in downtown Brampton, which received roughly $344,000. Congratulations to department staff who have worked on these funding applications. Next slide, please. The last slide provides a reminder for the upcoming 2023 FCM annual conference in Toronto. The early bird registration uh, deadline is April 21st. Uh, the government relations staff is available to provide support and assistance to members of council interested in attending. Staff are, work our staff are working at on advocacy materials and supports for the conference. Thank you very much and this concludes today's presentation. Thank you so much, Chris, for the update. Um, do any members of council have any questions regarding the update? I know everyone was following that, the two budgets very closely. Yes. <laughs> um, there are no questions, so I have a motion moved by Councillor Power to receive the presentation. All those in favor, anyone opposed, that motion carries. Thank you very much. The next item is uh, community services, Mr. Clerk. And I cannot remember now which items were held. I think I held 12.2.2 was held regarding the Bill Davis monument. And I'm trying to find it here in my package. Excuse me while I find it. Here it is. Okay. So the next item in community services is 12.2.2 is staff report regarding preferred site for William G. Davis Memorial Sculpture. And I held this item. So a couple... Um, of questions here, um, and I do have an amendment to the motion and have just very quickly spoken to the regional council appointed to the PAMA board on this particular topic. So um, the family is really requesting for the sculpture to be located at PAMA, and at this point in time, we need, I guess, regional council's blessing in order to have that location um, confirmed. 
Um, our urgency on this matter is that provincial funding would expire uh, within a year if a site is not confirmed. That's my understanding of the report. And I, I turn to, to Kelly and perhaps Bill just to confirm that I have that all straight. Yeah, uh, through the chair, that's correct. Okay. And so that being said, um, I just quickly spoke with Councillor Tor. There is some level of urgency, I think, on this one, just so that we don't lose the provincial funding. And um, Councillor Tor, I believe you're meeting with some members of PAMA to make sure that they're okay with that location. Um, and Councillor Pileshi, you have a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so we've tried that already, and Regional Council said no. So that's why we brought it back in-house. That's, that was always our, our preferred location, but now we're over a year past and, and we're going back to Regional Council. They've already said no. Uh, through the Chair, and Kelly can elaborate, but I believe Regional Council received the report, took no action, and then it came back to the city where the city stated they would, we would put it on Right, so ba basically they said no. So I think um, from what I recall, and perhaps we can get maybe more information to Council next week, for an update on what that happened at the region. The region council said no to funding um, the memorial uh, sculpture, but I don't know if they said no to the location. Kelly, do you have? Well, they... So maybe I can help this. No, no, thank you. Oh. They said no to... Um, they said no to kind of everything and said, this is this is your thing, Brampton. Um, we've all, we always wanted it at PAMA, but I recall it was, I think, Councillor Parrish that had said, um, go talk to PAMA, and if PAMA is okay with it, putting it on the lawn, then then that would be, because they're kind of they're kind of arm's length, they're not, but they're kind of arm's length, and if PAMA gave us the go ahead to put it on, on their front lawn, then I think Regional Council would have been okay with it, but. Um, Thank you, Councillor Pileshi. Kelly, did you want to respond to a little bit about that, and then I will, um, and then back to Councillor Pileshi. Sure, through the chair. Uh, similar understanding, Councillor Pileshi, that it was, uh, a report was taken to Regional Council, but it wasn't um, considered, that it came to the City of Brampton. We've been working with the family since that time. Uh, we've had sort of a, a few iterations on municipally owned property considering that, but it is the ultimate wish of the family to see it at the PAMA property, and they have requested that we um, request a, a formal consideration of it being on that site. Okay. Thank you. Any further questions, Councillor Pileshi? No. Nope. Okay. So to Councillor Pileshi's point, or Mayor Brown, go See, ahead. Yeah, Chair Sanders, I've had my hand up since the beginning. Yep, go ahead. So, okay. um, I've spoken to the family about this. They understand that we um, made the request to, to PAMA a year ago for both funding and, and location. Um, at Regional Council, it was met negatively. Councillor Pileshi is correct to both our requests. Um, but, uh, and, and I spoke to it, so I, I recall this um, well. You know, surprisingly, we had some opposition to a contribution or, or a location on a regional property, um, but the family has told me we should try at least one more time because that is their preference, and if we are unsuccessful, then they're grateful for the other uh, locations suggested by the city, but this one is sentimental to the family, given the family's history uh, when it was uh, um, a courthouse. And, the Davis family uh, history there. So um, I would support that, you know, trying once more, and if not, we'll have to um, go back to what we had suggested as using a city location. Thank you, Mayor Brown. Um, and Councillor Vicente, you were on the board of PAMA during that time. Um, so if you have any feedback regarding how those discussions went, that would be appreciated. Yeah, thank you very much, Madam Chair. There was some discussion at uh, the Friends of PAMA board, and Councillor Pleshi is correct. They are uh, somewhat arm's length and uh, tend to work more on uh, fundraising and uh, and other uh, aspects of PAMA. But with regards to the placement of the monument, they really never rendered any opinion, not a formal opinion, and uh, they didn't have any information that was concrete about the monument, uh, other than that the city of Brampton was requesting to have the monument placed on the property. Um, 
I think that uh, if we as City of Brampton now that we have the funding in place and can provide more detail, uh, I think it would be certainly very appropriate for us to forward this to uh, the region one more time and to seek support. It's a new term and uh, we do have provincial funding in place and uh, I think that uh, we as a council should put that forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Vicente. Just a uh, conversation with Pileshi because he brought up a good point that we're, the concern is that the region already punted it back to PAMA for an opinion. And then if we do that again, they're going to do the same thing and we're going to delay time. So I think, Councillor Pileshi, go ahead. You have um, something to add. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I think the proper process is go to PAMA, get their endorsement of this. Um, then go to the region and say, we have this covered. You don't have to do anything. You just need your your uh, signature to say we can, you know, utilize some space on your, on your front lawn. That being said, how much of that property do we own as the city? How much of that, how much of the triangle at the corner do we own? And could we possibly just sneak it in on our property? Potentially. Could we look into that? Thank you, Councillor Pileshi. So I'm going to ask that perhaps we may not be able to get that information right now. Yeah. But, but maybe at Council next week. Or, okay, go ahead, Steve. Yeah, through, through the Chair, what we can do is take that back as direction and, and look into uh, the uh, space in the daylight triangle of the property to see what um, could be accommodated, uh, provided that it meets some minimum safety requirements and whatnot. We can work with public work staff to do a high level concept and bring that back to council. Perfect, thank you. So I think we have a referral to council next week to include the following to, uh, to refer the report, but also for staff to report back on the um, property that is owned by the city of Brampton that could perhaps accommodate the memorial and not necessarily seek permission through PAMA or the region to install the monument. And then secondly, um, a referral back to council so that we receive, get some sort of endorsement, and this will be the motion for council endorsement, uh, seeking endorsement from PAMA through Councillor Tour, who is the new board member of PAMA, um, to locate the monument on that site. Does that work for everyone? Yeah, okay, so this is the referral, April 6th meeting of council and request approval, uh, sorry, um, and for staff to report back on city-owned property on the Pamela lands. Is that correct? And I think that based on confirmation of how much city land we own, if it is possible to put the, mo the memorial there as per Councillor Pileshi's recommendation, then that's great. And then plan B would be to seek PAMA's endorsement if necessary. So we'll deal with this next week. Recorded vote, please. All those in favor, please stand and then we'll take the vote virtually through the clerk. Those uh, present and voting in the affirmative is Councillor Brar, Councillor Pileshi, Chair Santos, Counsel, uh, Deputy Mayor Singh, Councillor Power, Councillor Tor. Um, Councillor Fortini, how do you vote? In favor. Thank you. Councillor Medeiros, how do you vote? In favor. Thank you. Councillor Keenan, how do you vote? In favor. Thank you. Councillor Vasante, how do you vote? In favor. Thank you. Mayor Brown, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you. That carries unanimously 11 to 0. Thank you very much, and we look forward to seeing that next week. The next item in community services, I believe, is Councillor's question period. Do any members have any questions regarding this section? I see none. Mr. Clerk, do we have any public questions related to the community services section? I see none. Thank you very much. I'll now pass it over to Deputy Mayor Singh for Public Works. All 
All right, thank you. We're on the public work section. So we, our first item is 11.3.1, which is a discussion item at the request of Mayor Brown regarding transit charter service request, Royal Canadian Legion District Convention, March 31st to April 2nd, 2023. Mayor Brown. Yes, uh, there should be some corresponding, um, the corresponding Report, letter. Yeah, we'll take it all together. That's 11.4.1. And if council wants to read that letter, if they haven't already, this is a request. Um, Brampton is hosting the Legion um, convention, and they would like the assistant, uh, assistance of Brampton Transit. Um, obviously, we've got a tremendous debt of gratitude for our veterans, and um, our two local Legion branches do tremendous work in our community. And if we can help them with this honour of hosting their convention to accept their request for the shuttle service that they required um, then um, I believe we should uh, do so, but maybe we could hear from our transit commissioner, um, uh, Alex, uh, if we have that capacity, if there's a, a bus at the time that they uh, requested. Sure, Agreed. does transit have any comments? And uh, through the chair, uh, I know that our operations team at transit have worked with uh, Nancy Flint at the Legion Branch 609, and uh, I understand that the uh, charters are for this coming weekend, and all arrangements have been made to accommodate the charter. We do have a charter rate that we're governed by uh, through the bylaw, and would take any council direction in terms of any other um, uh, charges to be uh, changed on that matter. Okay. Mayor Brown, any additional questions? Yeah. Then I would I would move a, a motion that we um, waive the um, the fee associated with that charter as per the Legion request. Okay, we will. And, and just for our knowledge, Alex, what is the fee that they're, they're requesting to be waived? The fee is approximately um, around $1,100 uh, through the chair. Okay, okay. Okay, just finalizing the motion and then we will pass it. I guess the correct way to say it is we're amending the recommendation. Um, 11.4.1. Oh, that's just correspondence. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We'll take the motion on the street, uh, on the screen, 11.3.1. And we'll also uh, receive the recommendations for 11.4.1. Is anybody opposed? Hearing and seeing none, the motion carries. 11.5 is councillor's question period. Do any members of council have any questions? Seeing and hearing none, we'll move on to public question period. Are there any questions regarding uh, the public work section? Through you, uh, Chair, uh, Acting Chair Singh, there are none online and I don't see anybody in the audience that wishes to come forward to ask questions. Perfect. Now I will pass it on uh, to Vice Chair Plushy for the legislative service section. Thank you. Welcome everybody to the legislative services section. Um, our first item is a staff presentation on the rental licensing and registration program. Um, a staff presentation by Jeff Humble, manager of policy, integrated city planning, planning, building and growth management um, regarding the rental licensing and registration program. Jeff. Humble, Manager of Policy Programs and Implementation, and I'll be making the presentation on this. I would like to acknowledge, uh, however, the work of Morella Palermo, who uh, drafted the report. Uh, she's not uh, here with us today, um, but I have my director here, Henrik uh, Spolgar, and of course, uh, Steve Ganesh, uh, and hopefully we can uh, collectively answer any questions. I believe Claudia LaRota is also on, online virtually. Um, just looking for the presentation. You, Mr. Chair, just we'll just bring it up momentarily. Yep. 
just like to uh, maybe uh, um, iterate for, for council. Um, there is, of course, the bylaw um, components. So there's two reports on council related to this item. Uh, we've worked uh, quite collaboratively um, with uh, bylaw enforcement on the development of our um, policy framework around this. We've had several meetings. There's been a lot of uh, collaboration in terms of uh, ensuring that uh, the approach that we're, we're taking is, uh, is working hand in hand from a policy and enforcement perspective. There we go. Okay, so um, I'll, I'll provide a brief overview uh, here uh, in this presentation on rental licensing and, and registration. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the purpose is to provide an overview of the rental licensing and registration programs, uh, talk a bit about the benchmarking that we did with some other municipalities on rental programs, and then uh, just a few kind of examples of uh, rental uh, code of conducts and how that might apply to Brampton. Next slide, please. It's a fun game. So just in terms of uh, background, uh, last year, um, staff received direction from council. Uh, there was a series of delegations at the November 26th uh, Committee of Council meeting, and then on the, on the 7th, uh, council directed staff to go back to look at options for residential landlord licensing, a rental code of conduct, benchmarking, um, and uh, incorporation of fees and other aspects of accountability measures. Next slide, please. So currently in uh, Brampton now, we, we have uh, a number of uh, policy programs relating to rental. And I would say beyond this, there are aspects of rent that occur outside of these. Uh, the additional residential units, the two unit dwellings, um, is something we've uh, been working on for the past five years. There's been new iterations as a result of the detached components, as well as Bill 23. Uh, supportive housing, which is administered by uh, Integrated City Planning, uh, which helps facilitate um, housing opportunities for the elderly and, uh, and disabled. Um, Short-term rentals, uh, which is something we provide generally citywide. That program was established uh, uh, several years, well, about a year and a half ago, uh, to regulate that industry, which, as everyone knows, is, is quite popular. And lastly, uh, lodging houses, which we uh, um, have annual licensing for. Uh, however, those are generally only permitted in certain areas of the city, uh, primarily in the downtown. Next slide, please. So part of this aspect of uh, the delegations that came forward is addressing the, um, the, the complaints that are generally received uh, from, from uh, neighborhoods. And so this slide uh, depicts the uh, complaints received pertaining to additional residential units. And this is roughly uh, 8,000 um, plus complaints received uh, between 2018 and 2022. Um, the good aspects, I suppose, about this slide is you, you do see a, climb, uh, a decline from 2018 and 2019 to more recent years where those complaints have been uh, more constant at a constant rate. Uh, it's also noted that not all of these uh, complaints uh, lead to violations, uh, so there's an aspect of that in terms of um, how that um, aspect compares to the complaints received and the effectiveness of uh, perhaps our bylaws and, and actions that can be taken on, uh, on the complaints. So aspects of property complaints and bylaws can certainly speak to this uh, uh, better than I, um, may relate to um, noise, uh, traffic, parking, um, unsightly properties, garbage, thing, things of that nature. Uh, next slide, please. So similarly, uh, lodging houses. Lodging houses are, are um, units that are uh, more that have more than four um, um, rooms or rental units in, in their dwellings. Uh, here you see we, we have um, uh, well over 2,000 uh, uh, complaints uh, received. Uh, what is different uh, on this slide, you'll notice, is that the, the no violation aspects is much higher. And part of this is due to the challenges of, uh, of um, proving what is a lodging house, and, and, and um, bylaw can speak to that. But um, generally, there's an aspect of, uh, of um, indicating whether a, a, a dwelling is op operating as a family unit 
or as a lodging house. And part of this as well might also be due to the fact that we only permit lodging houses in certain areas. So if we were more expansive on the application of that, and this is in the Housing Brampton plan, uh, we may get greater um, compliance and, uh, and a framework for uh, um, matching, um, dealing with, uh, with violations. Uh, next slide, please. So in, in terms of uh, benchmarking, um, the delegations made, uh, they, they, um, they mentioned the city of uh, Ottawa. I believe Councillor Santos raised uh, Waterloo. Uh, we looked at those. We looked at uh, others, um, Oshawa, uh, Mississauga, of course, Toronto, uh, Hamilton, uh, about a dozen in total. And what we found is, you know, there's basically three kind of themes or, or buckets uh, to approach um, a rental housing uh, registration program. One, of course, is uh, proactive enforcement. So not just dealing with complaints as they arise, but having a, a program whereby we can have a regular process um, to, um, to deal with these issues. Um, it can be coordinated through the approval process, or it can be coordinated through, let's say, geographic or, or neighborhood blitzes uh, at different times or schedules uh, of the year or, or over several years. Uh, the second one is rental licensing, and this ensures adequate measures are put in place uh, to safeguard the health and safety of residents. Uh, generally, they require annual review and submission of uh, various items. So this uh, typically addresses, you know, of course, the building code issues, uh, fire issues, uh, and standards, uh, and property insurance and zoning. So it is a little bit more rigorous than the uh, the next step, which or the, the the third component, which is rental maintenance. Uh, this is generally more of a uh, registration framework. Uh, for example, the air uses a one-time registration. They do have to go through certain aspects, uh, but generally speaking, uh, registration is, is um, a, a way for um, many municipalities to have kind of a bit of a contact list of, uh, of landlords uh, across the city so that uh, bylaw can uh, more directly uh, follow up uh, with them. Uh, next slide, please. So what we found in a number of uh, municipalities is this uh, rental code of conduct. And, and um, uh, generally, uh, codes of conduct are implemented as, as part of short-term rental programs. Uh, in, in the municipalities benchmark, it, it could be expanded a little bit beyond that. But uh, generally, all codes of conduct must have uh, an objective and, of course, some guiding principles. If we were to look at something like this for Brampton, of course, we would need a, a made in Brampton a solution given the context of, uh, of, of Brampton and the rental market. Uh, but generally it outlines the responsibilities of uh, landlords and tenants. Um, so there's certainly uh, some expectations of uh, uh, appropriate um, uh, behavior on, on the part of both of these. And um, the effectiveness of uh, this code of conduct is uh, contingent upon its relationship with all the other bylaw components. So from a legal perspective, we'd want to ensure that, you know, if we establish a code of conduct, that we have the tools and, and bylaw has the tools upon which we can uh, encourage uh, good behavior uh, amongst the, uh, the landlords and tenants. Uh, next slide, please. So some things uh, that uh, council may wish to consider is, uh, what is the issue that we're trying to solve? Uh, illegal uh, lodging houses is uh, certainly an area that we're receiving many complaints. And uh, there's certainly a relationship between um, the health and safety issues and some of the property standards uh, complaints we're dealing with. But uh, if parking, for example, is the issue, uh, there may be other tools uh, that we can use to, to deal with um, those issues. So kind of making sure that if we are to look at a program that it's targeted towards uh, uh, the right objectives. So moving forward, uh, are we looking at a registration program, a proactive enforcement strategy, a rental licensing program, or, or all three? Um, some parameters to consider uh, for the program. Um, is it being applied to a specific housing type? We noted the four housing types, and I would say even beyond those four we identified, there is a lot of rental activity. In fact, you might think of it a, a bit like an iceberg where the four that we identified is what we see on the surface, but below there's a, there's a much bigger rental market um, that we're, we may not be fully aware of. 
Uh, would there be a, uh, a minimum bedroom cap considered uh, for the program, for example, six or more units? Uh, will there be application fees? Um, is there an appeal process? And it would be more effective to launch as a, uh, as a pilot program. Um, we know, talking to some municipalities, it took them several years to develop their program and to uh, kind of hone in, I guess, on what it is they're actually focusing on. So, you know, we may wish to uh, launch a pilot program over a, a several year period and, and kind of uh, focus on uh, some particular aspects and then, and then kind of ramp that up. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is the last slide. Uh, so um, in terms of administration, uh, when will the program take effect and will there be a grace period or grandfathering of existing units? We certainly want to encourage uh, all landlords to participate in this program. Um, which city department will be responsible for administering the program? So right now we have um, uh, city integrated city planning, we have clerks, um, we have uh, building, uh, all administering different aspects of uh, rental programs. Does it make sense to put these under, under one umbrella to uh, streamline the process and have uh, more concentrated customer service? Uh, will the program be cost neutral from a financial perspective? Uh, when, analyzing, when analyzing the uptake of the program, we need to consider the aspects of staff. There will likely be more staff resources required, not just uh, from an enforcement perspective, but in terms of administering the program. Uh, software, for example, Excella, uh, would, would need some significant uh, updating to, to get that set up to administer a, a robust uh, registration licensing program. And uh, so those, those would be things that need to be considered as part of, as part of a budget um, going forward. Uh, will we look at the citywide implementation or do we want to target maybe specific geographic areas? If there are hotspots in the city or areas that we're receiving some complaints, do we want to maybe establish a pilot program to, to focus on those components? And then lastly, in terms of measuring um, success, um, I think you see some of the statistics there, but again, it's using the right tools, the right policies and programs to ensure that we're effectively addressing the aspects that council wants us to address, whether it's property standards or whether it's uh, the health and safety of students uh, and, and ways that we can measure that we're actually being effective. And uh, how do we get landlords to participate in the program? So we, I, th I think we need to recognize that landlords are fulfilling a, a, a very important need. Uh, Housing Brampton uh, recognizes the affordability challenges in the GTA in Brampton and we need to find ways to encourage them to uh, to fully participate and engage in the process. And lastly, um, um, again, through perhaps a pilot program or, or an annual review, uh, is the program achieving the desired results as outlined in, in the scope of work? Uh, happy to answer any, any questions you might Thanks, have. Thanks, Jeffrey. Um, for the presentation, please thank Morella for the, for the report work she's done on the report. Um, of Councillor Santos. Thank you, through you. Oh. thank you through you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you to staff for this report as well as the proactive bylaw enforcement report that is, as you had mentioned, court, like they, they correspond to each other. It also corresponds to the work that we're doing on the Brampton Charter supporting international students. Um, as well as the delegates from Councillor Keenan and Medeiros' ward who delegated, I believe it was in December after we passed this motion related to property standards issues as well as um, characterization and character of the neighbourhood with the many suspected illegal units within their community. And both Councillor Vicente and myself, as you can see from the corresponding report in the map um, of hotspots, when the, if you see that map, wards one, three, four, five, there is a high concentration of issues and we certainly hear it from our residents on an ongoing basis. Um, a motion has been drafted to bring forward a pilot program based on the information in the report, based on benchmarking from other municipalities. Many municipalities have already either implemented or are currently piloting a similar thing that we are looking at. And as they're piloting and getting their results back on how things are going with their licensing programs, we can also compare and con contrast ours should this motion pass today. Um, we spent a lot of time working with uh, staff 
on this motion as well as some of my colleagues across the table as well as Vice Chair Pileshi to put this together to also save us a little bit of time debating on issues on this matter which have been already debated before. So I don't think we need to, we need to point that out. That being said, um, you brought up some things that I just wanted clarification on. Who currently administers the short-term license, short-term rental licensing? Through, I believe, city clerks. Yeah, through you, Chair Palachi, the city clerk's office does. The clerk's office does. Yep. So the reason why I ask that, and when the report comes back on how we're going to implement this, this pilot program, we may want to make some considerations to that because there are parallels to licensing with, with respect to short-term licensing and putting in long-term licensing into that issue or into, into um, that program that already exists. Also, I want to note that in the report itself, which in this motion has an amendment to the short-term licensing. So short-term licensing right now, according to our program, does not include random inspections, as I had a conversation with bylaw enforcement on this. And part of the reason why was in regards to the number of resources in order to do an annual inspection of all these short-term rentals. So, but, but I, I, in asking Paul, Commissioner, Acting Commissioner Paul Morrison, if a random inspection as part of that renewal process for short-term rentals could be implemented and whether or not that would have um, significant like, limitations to um, bylaw enforcement. And the answer was no, like random would be good. So at least there's some checks and measures in place that if there's a number of complaints on short-term rentals, we could do a random inspection and short-term rental license holders would have to know that we could go in, do a random fire inspection, do a random building code uh, inspection, et cetera. So that, that also being said, in the motion, in speaking to some members of staff, they had also mentioned that to implement an annual inspection requirement would require a lot of resources as well. So in the implementation report coming back, I would also highlight that in the therefore clause, therefore be it resolved clause 3D, it was intentional to put the word include annual and or random inspections to give some flexibility and practical practicality in terms of budget and resource constraints, but still make sure that we have some flexibility to conduct inspections should there be a crazy amount of complaints um, that come forward related to a licensed rental property. Um, so that's that. And then I, one amendment to this particular motion under the whereas is Mr. Clerk is a minor one. Whereas number six, uh, there's a missing word. So enforcement received more than 8,800 property standard complaints. So whereas number six, just add after enforcement the word received. And I believe um, my colleagues have already received this motion in its draft final format prior to today. And so this is the motion that I'm bringing forward and quite frankly, I think it's gonna help us resolve or at least begin to resolve and look at how to resolve um, the unlice or the, the the issue we have with ARUs, upcoming garden suites, issues with lodging homes. And one final note before I move it on to my colleagues is that we are prioritizing the health and safety of our residents, first and foremost, but also the impact that the on the increase in ARUs and garden suites are having um, in our local neighborhoods, which residents, quite frankly, didn't anticipate whatever happened in their neighborhood. And while the registration process has been incredibly successful, uh, thanks to all the work in Rick's department, you know, from, what was it, about 1,500 in 2018 or so to over 16,000 registered, the, the reality is, is that registration is different from licensing because at this point in time, the way that it, that it is being done, because 
when you rent a unit, you're operating a business. And why is it that a rental unit or a landlord can operate a business and be subject to a lower threshold than a nail salon, which has a higher threshold in terms of the licensing requirements to open a, a nail salon. And I think that we should be prioritizing health and safety first and foremost, as well as addressing the, the concerns from the residents who are experiencing the increase in ARU's garden suites and lodging homes in their communities. Thank you very much to the staff for putting this forward. That is the motion, and hope we can count on everyone's support. And Councillor Keenan is seconding the motion. Back to you. Thank you, Councillor Santos. Uh, Deputy Mayor. Yeah, I just um, want to know, are we going to distinguish um, those units that are in a primary residence? So if I'm the homeowner and uh, I have uh, a rental unit um, in the basement, is there going to be, a, I think, are they going to be treated differently in this motion than, say, a, an investor who has eight or nine houses or one or two houses and and um, has maybe an additional residence unit plus a basement plus the top floor? Are we going to distinguish that? Uh, that, that is a great question, um, uh, Councillor Singh, and, and I think it, it uh, partly depends on the aspect of the rental component, for example, whether it's a short-term rental or a... Uh, or uh, an ARU, um, I believe short-term rentals, there is a, a, a distinction between uh, uh, an in-home, um, where, where the principal owner is actually residing in the unit versus not. Um, but we, we, we can, I think, take that under advisement, recognizing that uh, I think, you know, that, that that is a concern. If you have a, a rental landlord that has a, maybe half a dozen properties across the city, and uh, how, do we, uh, how do we address that issue, I don't know. Uh, through you, uh, Acting Chair, to, to Deputy Mayor Singh, it, it, from a practical perspective, it's difficult to, to enforce. We've, we did, uh, at the onset of the uh, second unit registration program, we did have a differentiation between uh, units, um, second units that were in a principal dwelling versus second units that were, uh, where both units were rented out. Mm -hmm. And uh, to speak quite frankly, um, Applicants will put whatever they need to on, on the application uh, and then at whatever happens after the fact is difficult to follow or enforce. Uh, similarly, we've seen um, people register businesses uh, to rent multiple units across the city, but likewise we've seen them register a business for a single household uh, where they, they live in and rent, uh, rent the unit below. So from, from an enforcement perspective, it is uh, definitely difficult to differentiate between the, the two uh, types of landlords that, that you've mentioned. Uh, um, I'm not understanding why it'd be difficult if it's a primary residence, sorry. Can you just, so if I live, like I have many examples in my area, I'd say majority are where a family lives on the top floor and they've licensed the bottom floor. And I think that, that should be distinguished between the opposite, where the top floor is rented and the bottom floor. I mean, that's, that is a distinction. I mean, these are just regular hardworking families and adding an additional regulatory regime <laughs> is, you know, in this economy and everything, I, I think we have to be careful to distinguish the, the two. Yep. Through you, uh, through you, um, Acting Chair uh, Pileshi, I, I understand, uh, Deputy Mayor, where, where uh, your perspective, and, and we can try to propose some, some ideas yeah. uh, to tackle this, uh, but it, it has been uh, a struggle in the past to uh, differentiate them. And if we have two uh, separate regimes, one for principally owned residences and one for uh, landlords that don't live there, um, how do we track that after the sale of a home or after those, uh, you know, after that principal? Well, with this licensing, would we be up every year applying or, or would we be checking every year? Because that could be one way. But I mean, your taxes look at it just differently too. A principal residence, you know, you're not taxed on the capital gains versus. So I think, you know, we just have to be sensitive to that. Like, I'm just thinking off the top of my head, like in my area, like I've, I've retired couples who have. Uh, 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 basement that's legalized, but, you know, bringing that rental income. So I don't, I just want to distinguish the two groups. I mean, we can start out as a pilot project, it's happened, it's not in my ward, so, uh, but if it was ever going to come in my ward, I, I would, you know, fight 
very hard to make sure we distinguish uh, the two. Your, your uh, perspective is uh, fully understood, and we'll definitely try to think outside the box to uh, see how we could differentiate them. Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, Councillor Keenum. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to make a couple comments and, and thank staff for um, the efforts that they've put into this um, across many departments to, to bring it, uh, what I would call quickly, um, from when we first brought this up in November. Um, and I would be remiss if I didn't thank um, the community groups in, in mine and Councillor Medeiros' ward uh, uh, in particular, Peel Village and uh, downtown Brampton groups um, for their time and effort that they put in um, with multiple meetings and really being engaged in this, which has been incredible for me to see. Um, and um, to Councillor Santos, um, the way that this was circulated for everybody to have their input um, and really try to get this across the finish line the best way possible. Um, and I'm very happy to see uh, where it's at and, and how this motion is is drafted um, and fully supportive of it and i know that uh, it is going to be a pilot project and i think you know there is definitely work that will need to be done um, and tweaking along the way um, but i think this is a, a great start um, and i'm happy to see the progress that we're making so so far and so early on so i just wanted to uh, make those comments and uh, very happy to support this motion thank you Thank you, uh, Councillor Keenan. Members of Council, you have before you. Oh, sorry, it's Councillor Vincente. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you very much. Uh, so, um, want to thank uh, staff for the report. I also want to thank Councillor Santos uh, for the work that she's done on this file. In wards one and five, we uh, campaigned extensively, but also in the last term, uh, worked with residents who um, came to us seeking help and support for a variety of different issues that they witnessed within their community, whether it was uh, property standards or other issues caused by uh, rental units uh, where landlords and occupants just weren't taking care, no duty of care whatsoever with regard to their property. And uh, things are getting out of hand. And it's time that we wrap our arms around this issue and try to bring things under greater control. And so to have a licensing regime that um, potential landlords must comply with having the ability to inspect, and I agree with you, Councillor Santos, in regards to uh, the, uh, uh, the idea that we may do either of an annual inspection or a random inspection, because that is the kind of enforcement and the kind of oversight that as a municipality, we are obligated to provide. And um, I am very hopeful that this will mean that over time, landlords take greater responsibility and look after their properties better and that we can elevate the quality and living conditions for our residents. At the end of the day, we want to make sure that safety continues to be a top priority, but we also want to ensure that uh, when a property is leased out or rented out, that it does so in a way that doesn't detract from the quality of life of other residents who live nearby. And so I'm um, looking forward to seeing this implemented and seeing how we can elevate um, the quality of life for residents here in the city of Brampton. Excellent, thank you, thank Councilor you. Vincente. Um, I'll bring forward 8.2.1 and the motion uh, will take it as read, which includes receipt of uh, item 8.2.1 the current city licensing registration program, rental housing overview of potential landlord licensing programs and landlord code of conduct. It's been moved by Councillor Santos. All in favor, carries. Our next item is 8.2 point. Oh, right. Sorry. That wasn't part of the motion. It's been moved by Councillor Keenan. Um, receipt of the presentation. All in favor, 
That carries. Next item is 8.2.2, Proactive Property Standards Exterior Enforcement. Councillor Santos. Thank you through you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to say this is a this is a report to be received and thank you to the bylaw enforcement staff and uh, Acting Commissioner for putting the report forward. Absolutely support the 12 month pilot moving forward as well as uh, it's indicated in the report. Again, this goes hand in hand with the work that we are doing with uh, we, that we just discussed in this motion um, and in our conversations with with staff and vice chair. Paleshi, it's going to help and they're going to complement each other's work. So thank you very much. Those are all my comments for that one and I uh, look forward to more proactive enforcement of property standards. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, Chair. sorry, thank you, <laughs> Councillor Santos. Maybe we can switch because I actually have comments on this. So <laughs> move the chair be heard. Yes. Thank you. Um, and I actually meant to hold this one, not 824, so I'm happy to move 824 when, when that time comes. Um, 822, and uh, in our brief discussions, and kind of what is troubling me a little bit is the, the parking on, on the grass portion of this. And I know it's not, I don't know if it's clearly defined or clearly outlined the process in terms of, or policy that um, prohibits the parking on on the grass if it's you know I can see if if somebody accidentally is parking one tire on on the lawn um, you know I don't know if that should be by way of um, somebody to uh, to issue any orders to comply or 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 give a ticket um, and I know that's kind of it's in the um, you know it's up to the kind of the bylaw officers but I don't want I, want, I want the process to be outlined and, and, and it to be defined so that you're taking, you're taking stuff like that away from the officers. Like they don't need to, I think, have that. It, for me, it would be just an added stress. If there's not a defined process of this is how we do it, then, you know, leaving it up to me is, you know, they're busy enough. I think that um, that's not fair. Um, so I think if we could look at opportunities for, you know, if there's three tires on the lawn or if there's two tires on the lawn, you know, that's, that's something different. If there's a car that's, that's parked on the inter, uh, inner lock in front of the front door where it's clearly not supposed to, not allowed to be there, I think that needs to be uh, defined. And so if, if we can just in, in future think about um, the processes and trying to you know, support the officers that have to go to, to these calls in terms of, you know, this is, it's black and white, it's not gray. Um, I think that, uh, I think that better serves not only the residents, but our officers as well. So just those comments and, and something to, uh, to maybe look at in the future. So through you, Madam, Madam Chair, to Councillor Pelosi, uh, comments well taken. Um, we, we normally attend most of those type of events reactively. So if somebody's called us, uh, we do, I don't think we find that many proactive ones. So we don't go looking for those unless it's, it's so egregious that we have to stop. Uh, so what we'll do is we can reflect back on those. We can do a data sort. We can look at those tickets and then we can put a training package together for our officers and, and, and remind them to, uh, to have an understanding of, of, of the, the need to park sometimes uh, with one tire on the lawn. Sometimes somebody will come home with groceries and they'll pull in their driveway, they don't realize they pulled it onto the grass. It's the ones that are purposely parking there to make room for other cars, so, um, uh, and they don't want to do any more driver wi driveway widening, they don't want to do any of that, they just park on the grass, or they travel right across the grass to get out. We have many incidents of that. So. We'll, we'll take this back and we'll revisit it. Excellent, thank you. Uh, it's been moved by Councillor Tour, item 8.2.2, the staff report proactive property standards exterior enforcement be received. All those in favor? That carries. Next item, did you hold 823, Councillor? Uh, no. I held 824, happy to move it. All in favor? That carries. 825, staff report annual report access to information protection. Yeah. Privacy, you held that. Yeah. Councillor Sen. 
Thank you through you, Mr. Chair. So um, read the report. It was a good information report on very aspects, various aspects in terms of um, what we're uh, legislated to do. One thing that I had mentioned to Acting Commissioner um, Paul Morrison it, that was missing was the process. Um, and what is the process from when a request is made until how it's decided that it has to go through until etc. So that was what was missing and just wondering if staff have any comments on um, on that. So through Mr. Chair, uh, Councillor, we act, actually I did speak to Peter yesterday about this and Peter uh, did uh, say that we can provide a, a process for you to show exactly how we have been through this. Peter, do you want to comment on that at all? Through, through you, um, uh, Acting Chair Pileshi, yes. Um, we can probably devise a graphic that puts up a, what a typical timeline is. Um, suffice to say, though, legislatively, um, once a, a freedom of information request is received, there's a legislative deadline of essentially 30 days to reply to that. And unfortunately, it's not calendar. Or it's not. It is calendar days. It's not business days. I know that. I can tell you that uh, clerk, uh, the clerk's office, our access and privacy coordinators, are part of a working group across the province that are working with AMCTO to potentially identify to the province some uh, housekeeping amendments to the Municipal Freedom of Information Protection and Privacy Act because it is, um, it's 1991 legislation that hasn't been amended very much. Um, but 30 days is, is what we have and uh, typically um, what we try to do is to get out a request, respond to it with a decision within that 30 day timeline. There are a few occasions where we have to go outside to get um, what I'll say um, consent or approval or comment from a third party because the information may have originated from the third party. A typical example of that could be a, a bid on a procurement. Um, or we can, if we know that there's a, a, a lot of records in response to a request that comes in, um, we may be able to request an extension of time beyond the 30 days. But generally one extension only is granted. Mm -hmm. um, so the first thing we do when we get a request is we try to clarify it to make sure it's clear. Um, and uh, as part of that, once we determine that it is clarified, the clock starts after the payment is made of $5, which again is something that probably could be updated in the, in the legislation. Um, and then typically what we do is through days one to four is we uh, get the documentation together, figure out where in the organization, in the institution, those, docu those records may exist. Then we put out a records requisition to the responsible parties uh, with, across the institution, departments, individuals that we know may have those resp potentially responsive records. We generally give seven days um, for those departments, individuals to provide those, identify those records, provide them back to the access and privacy coordinator. Uh, sometimes if there is a lot of records, we do provide an extension. Um, and then usually, um, so we do have a bit of a grace week, I'll call it between days sort of 13 to 20. And then we really have to rely on days 21 to 28 in the 30 day timeline to actually analyze the records that come in. Mm -hmm. And it could be, five pages, it could be 5,000 pages. And I can tell you we do have requests that are that large and larger. Mm -hmm. And so we have to analyze all of that, identify potential redactions or exemptions under the MFIPA legislation uh, so we can issue a decision and it, it gives us a timeline of day 29, day 30 to get a decision out to, um, to the requester. So our goal is to try and hit all of those timelines and hit that request within that 30 day window. Uh, but as you see from the report, um, it's not always possible depending on the complexity or the simplicity of, of the request in terms of how long it takes to respond. Thank you and through you Mr. Um, Chair, just a couple of follow-up questions. So who is it that determines whether or not the request is clear enough? Through you uh, Mr. Chair, it's, it's essentially myself as the head delegated by council for the institution. Uh, we do, I can tell you though that we, uh, the access and privacy team, we don't know everything about everything in the city. So we do work with the departments to try and um, scope, scope or clarify the request to the extent possible. Thank you, Mr. Clerk, and, and through you, Mr. Chair, just another question. How subjective is the process? The, the, through you, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, to Councillor Santos, the process is designed not to be subjective, to be very objective. Uh, subjectivity does um, um, weigh in. I'd probably sort of stay away from subjectivity and say it's more, this is a balancing act. This is a mm -hmm. balancing act of the rights of individuals to access the records of a public institution like a municipality, uh, balancing that with the ability of the municipality to carry on its work. And this should not be seen as an extraordinary 
uh, work effort that um, may detract the municipality from carrying on its work, the services we provide. So we're always mindful of trying to balance uh, those two interests to make sure that we can uh, meet the requirements of the legislation. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Um, Chair, with respect to the process, is it first come, first dealt with, or are things prioritized above others? And if so, where is there subjectivity in relation to the prioritization of what needs to get processed faster? Uh, good question. Thank you, Councillor Santos. There, there isn't any um, subjectivity in that. We, the 30-day clock starts for every FOI, Freedom of Information request that comes in, when it comes in, when it's deemed to be clarified to the extent possible. And that's something that we can't, um, we can't stop the clock, so to speak. There, mm -hmm. We can stop the clock if it's completely unclear what the request is, to make sure that it's a clear request to the extent that we can identify to actually do the work necessary. Um, but if, if one comes in on Monday, we don't hold it, and if one comes in on Wednesday, that's simple, we do the simple one first. We, the clock starts for each request once each request comes in and it's clarified, and the $5 fee is paid. We're required under the legislation to start the clock, so to speak. Okay, thank you. Through you, Mr. Chair. So it is first come, first dealt with? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. No further questions? Thank you, Councillor Santos. Uh, there is nobody else on the board. Peter? It's been moved by Councillor Santos that the report, uh, annual report on the access to information and protection of pro uh, privacy program for 2022 be received. All in favor? That carries. Our next item is Councillor question period. Are there any members of Council that uh, have any questions related to any item on the agenda? Seeing none. Public question period. Uh, Mr. Clerk, is there anybody from the public that would like to ask any questions? Through you, Mr. Chair, I do not see any in the clerk's inbox, and I don't see anybody present that wishes to come forward to ask a question. Thank you. I'd now like to turn the chair over to Councillor Tour for economic development. Have any items in this section? Do we? Yeah. For you, Mr. Chair, there's not except councillor's question period and public question period, and I can advise there's no questions from yep. pub the public. And so our next item is 9.5, councillor question period for this section of the agenda. Uh, if the members don't have any questions, uh, we can move on to the public question period, item 9.6. If there's any questions from members of the public, anybody online or in person, uh, seeing none, I will ask. The, um, I will now pass the chair to Councillor Broad, uh, for the chair of the Corporate Services Section. Service Section. Our next item is 10.1.1, a staff presentation from Tara Hunter, Manager sponsorship and corporate development office of CAO regarding external funding update 2022. We do have a staff report, but that is deferred to next week council meeting. So welcome to Thank you. My name is Tara Hunter and I'm the uh, manager for sponsorship and corporate development in the office of the CAO. And I'm here today with uh, my sponsorship team, uh, Mike Miele, Sponsorship Coordinator, and Casey Hanavan, Coordinator of Sponsorship and Grants, as well as colleagues in Government Relations, to highlight the achievements from 2022 of the City's Centralized External Funding Program, which is made up of sponsorship and naming rights, third-party advertising, and grants. So I'll turn it over to Mike, who is going to talk about sponsorship and naming rights. Good morning, Mayor and members of council. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to speak. My name is Mike Miele and I'm the sponsorship coordinator with the City of Brandon. Uh, I'd like to take a few minutes and highlight some of the 2022 accomplishments that the city sponsorship team has achieved. In 2022, our department was able to generate just under $760,000 in cash sponsorship and naming rights revenue, and just under $100,000 in in-kind sponsorships. Oh, sorry, next slide. 
No, one more. One more. Oh, there we go. Um, this exceeded our target by 47% and represented a 63% increase in cash revenue over the previous year. We worked together with 46 businesses who sponsored over 30 city-run events, programs, and initiatives, representing an increase in 15 all-new sponsors in 2021. Uh, the next few slides will provide some examples of our major wins in 2022. Next slide, please. In 2022, we announced a multi-year naming rights uh, to the Great Golf Cricket Pitch at Terramoto Park, which was our first cricket pitch naming rights deal. Cricket continues to be a main uh, topic of discussion in many of our business meetings that we have, and we are confident that we will see uh, more pitches named in the future. Next slide, please. Quality Suites was one of our new sponsors in 2022 and first ever Peel Village Golf sponsor. Together with our recreation team, we identified Peel Village as a new asset that could be offered to businesses to help reach their target audience. Quality Suites has also named the Quality Suites Cricket Pitch at McCandless Park, which will hopefully be uh, completed by late spring. Next slide, please. Uh, Multi-year sponsorships have been a focus of our team as it provides stability and consistency year to year. Algoma University has been one of our longest partners and in 2022 agreed to a multi-year deal with the City of Brampton. Algoma University was also the first sponsor to step up and support our Heartbeats uh, in Performing Arts program that provides co-op and internship um, opportunities for black and indigenous youth. Next slide, please. Uh, while sponsorship remains an important source of non-tax revenue, it has also become an opportunity to create meaningful programs to benefit our residents. In 2022, we were able to work with Electra Utilities to provide free drop-in basketball for our youth. Uh, this program was not only free, but it offered a safe space for our youth to go after school. Electra has since renewed this sponsorship in 2023. Next slide, please. As a sponsorship team, it is very important that we continue to enhance and diversify our sponsorship opportunities that we're able to present to sponsors and businesses. In 2022, we partnered with BMO to, and worked with Enbridge and Canadian Red Cross to provide 700 uh, emergency preparedness kits to new Canadians. This allowed those new Canadians to be prepared in the case of an unexpected emergency. And this is just another example of how we work and collaborate with other city departments to provide new meaningful experiences to our city residents. Next slide, please. Uh, naming rights um, is one of those, uh, it's a big project of ours and our longer term high value agreements and will ultimately play an important role in sustaining our annual revenue number year over year. Our department is actively selling two different types of naming rights. You have exterior or facility naming rights, but then you also have amenity naming rights such as cricket pitches, ice rinks, gymnasiums, and so forth. There are still many different opportunities, uh, naming rights opportunities available. We are selling Gore Meadows Community Center, Embleton Community Center, and the new Century Gardens Youth Hub. Next slide, please. I just wanted to quickly acknowledge and thank all our sponsors in 2022. As you will see, we are working with national brands as well as many local brands to, uh, and helping them reach their audience through our events and programming. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank our departments um, that we work with on a daily basis who allow these sponsorships to come to fruition and deliver exceptional programming to our residents. Next slide, please. Uh, one more, please. So I'm just going to quickly talk about advertising. Um, or, uh, there's a few slides, but advertising is a very transactional approach to generating non-tax revenue for the city of Brampton. While there is an established program in transit, um, advertising opportunities that are, that are less developed have become a new revenue stream for the city. In 2022, we did not renew the third-party arena board advertising contract and have taken the sales in-house and have been able to generate over $60,000 in revenue. This was done through two channels. Uh, there are select community centers with digital screens and also the ice rink arena boards, um, which were both solely sold by our team. Um, I will now pass it back to Tara to speak uh, on other initiatives related to third-party advertising. Uh, next slide, please. So Out of Home is another key advertising 
uh, strategy, and as Mike alluded to, transit is an example of out-of-home advertising. The city has a very developed program where we are receiving high-value contracts for the sale of advertising on buses, bus shelters, and bus benches. Digital billboards or another, or billboards in general, are another form of out-of-home advertising. In Brampton, the sign bylaw um, has constrained billboards in the city. Uh, late last year, this council did approve a new contract for digital screens on um, CN Rail Bridge overpasses, and that um, came with a site-specific sign by law amendment. So there is an opportunity to continue to pursue revenue generation through third-party advertising um, on digital on billboards, and the industry is going to digital. Um, so. That is sort of in terms of 2023 looking forward, an opportunity that we would be looking to pursue. And I will leave it there um, until there's, uh, the, there was another agenda item that's been deferred. So we'll go to the next slide. So um, I will wrap up today talking about perhaps the biggest opportunity for the city in terms of external funding, which is grants. Grant funding is primarily um, through higher orders of government that the city is receiving, but we do pursue granting opportunities from the private sector, such as um, Canadian Tire Jumpstart and TD Friends of the Environment. But the focus for the city is obviously on funding from the provincial and federal governments, which is why we are so closely um, intertwined with our colleagues in government relations. So the centralized approach for the city is really um, facilitating the uh, resources to provide um, support for staff in pursuing an application for a specific project. We're able to monitor um, and track open funding opportunities, as well as standardize processes and track and report. And really what we're here doing today is an example of the centralized process where we are reporting on behalf of funding that other departments have received. Next slide, please. So in 2022, um, the city announced funding was 21.5 million and that was based on 24 successful applications um, submitted by staff. The funding process, and this is the importance for tracking, can sometimes be delayed where we will submit an application one year and it will not be until the next year that we're hearing about it. So in fact, um, half of applications that were, that were approved in 2022 were submitted in 2021. Next slide, please. So this chart is highlighting the um, funding that was announced for the city in 2022. And I would like to call attention to the Susan Fennell um, retrofit project that received funding from the Green Inclusive Community Building Fund, not only from a dollar amount perspective at 15.7 million, but also from the perspective that this was an incredibly oversubscribed fund, less than 10% of applications were received, were successful. And so the city of Brampton was in that uh, percentage. And it goes to show the importance of having done um, a lot of pre-studies that are required for an application to be strong. And so the granting process can have a long lead time. As we know from the recent uh, budget announcements, there doesn't seem to be a lot of new funding um, that is opening up for municipalities to be going after. And so the funding that is available, it will be important that our city projects are aligned to the, gov the priorities of government, particularly around sustainable infrastructure, uh, will be key. So having shovel-ready projects that align with the uh, with the priorities of government will be very important moving forward. Um, and we've had a strong start to the year, this year with nine applications already submitted. Uh, the GICB did have a second intake, and so the city has submitted two projects uh, for, for that fund. We've also submitted for Canada Summer Jobs, as well as to FCM for three feasibility studies for building retrofits. And pursuing those types of 
their smaller dollar amounts, but pursuing that type of funding is really important because it is providing um, kind of the prerequisites that are often required um, for larger applications. So I've had the privilege of reporting out on the efforts of staff um, and would like to thank you for the opportunity to highlight the great work that is being done um, by staff here at the city um, that is contributing to the city receiving important external funding that's driving city building um, and delivery of services. So, thank you. Thank you so much for that presentation. So we do have that um, the staff report um, that's related to this item. It's 10.2.5. Uh, we have Councillor Pileshi on the board. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Tara, for uh, and Mike for the uh, presentation. I'm glad that to see that we've taken over the um, mainly the boards, the hockey boards. Um, what I have seen, though, in the past, and given um, my expertise in this field, being in hockey rinks almost every weekend now, um, all over the place, <laughs> I've seen where other municipalities, um, in particular um, uh, Guelph, Caledon, um, and even even uh, Wellington County, where they really maximize not only the boards but the walls behind. And it's probably because, you know, they haven't won as much as, as many championships as we have, and we have all the championship banners and stuff, which is really, really good. But South Fletcher's, um, <clears throat> or Susan Fennell now, uh, for for instance, I, and I was over there um, over the weekend, and I think we only have two boards um, down in the, in the far left. I thought that that's all I had seen, and I think, maybe the, one of the other rinks has all the banners, so we have like this massive empty wall. Um, when is the opportunity for us to fill up these banners, or fill up uh, the, the boards, um, is my one question. Are we looking at opportunity where we can put something on the walls, some kind of bigger um, banner for, for organizations? And then also our baseball fields. Um, out in the you know the outfield is a perfect uh, uh, opportunity for uh, for something similar as well. So um, I'm sure we're looking into it. When yes, thank you there. for that question. So I think um, from the the rink standpoint for the banners, that is definitely on our radar. Um, we are selling naming rights to rinks, and so having that um, signage opportunity reserved for someone who has the naming rights has been the strategy thus far. Mm -hmm. um, but we can certainly be looking at it as more of the advertising opportunity. And then baseball fields, in terms of adding that to our overall inventory, um, absolutely. I think it raises, as we look at new opportunities and how many are available, um, having, we're sort of limited by resources as well. Mm -hmm. And so um, we're kind of managing that. So I, and I love the big ticket items of the of the naming rights. I find can we and can we Peter put the or Charlotte put that screen back up the uh, twenty one locations sixty thousand in revenue. No. Yeah. That. Yeah. So. Um, those digital screens are the, those are 13 digital screens in our rec centers now? In 2022, that was what we were selling. That program has expanded, and so it is now in more locations. So for 2023, um, that will be increasing. For 2023, it's increasing? Yes. To what? Uh, I think our total is third. I'll have to get back to you. Okay. But it, um, that is based on being in two locations, so... Gore Meadows and Loafers Lake, and the re recreation screen program has expanded to other locations. And oh, so okay. the advertising will expand okay. with that. Um, and then so the rink board adds 21 advertisers. So that's not necessarily boards. Those are 21 individuals. They might have multiple rec centers, multiple space. Correct. Um, and then how are we ramping that up and when are we going to see some more advertisers on the specifically on the boards so we took over the rink boards uh, in queue the existing third-party contract ended in July mm -hmm. and so 
we took on in-house and had to figure out how we were going to do it in-house. And so we didn't actually start selling um, until Q, it was sort of September. And so installation happened in October. So what, we're, what you're seeing is really based on a really short sales window. Mm -hmm. We have had a second sales window, but really um, August and September will be, July and August in the summer will be our big selling period to have the boards installed for the start of the season in September. So you should be seeing it in September. Okay, and were we able to capture the majority of the people that were with the, the other, um, I guess this, the yes. other vendor that our was our vendor we were yes. able to capture yeah. we have yeah we yeah. did we did well great good um the other question that i had uh, uh with relation to bridges um and i know that um you know we're looking at the cn bridge but there are other opportunities where maybe we can and i know there's a relationship there with cn and then a third party um but maybe there's other opportunities in the city of Brampton where it, there are bridges, and maybe we can directly um, have uh, a different relationship and cut out kind of CN in terms of the third party or the vendor and see what we can do um, in some of the other bridges across the city. Also, is there opportunities for us to look at, um, I know there's a lot in the north, maybe in... Bramalee as well. There's a lot of pedestrian underground uh, tunnels. Um, is there opportunity for us to put some kind of advertisements in those tunnels? Um, and I think a lot, especially the ones in, in Heart Lake, um, when you're going under the tunnel, you're going to the Heart Lake Town Center. So maybe there's opportunities for, for us to include uh, some of the um, stores of the Heart Lake Town Center and in, in to be included in some of that space. So there's those opportunities because those un tunnels also need um, some attention put towards them because a lot of people don't like to use them now because they smell. Okay. We'll look into that. Thank you, Councillor Pleshi. Thank you, Madam Chair. We have Councillor Keenan on the board. You have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just had a couple quick questions and, and thank you both so much for the presentation. Um, my questions are, I'm going to bring you back to the rink boards. Uh, like uh, Councillor Pelleschi, I find myself in the rinks quite a bit these days. Um, and I just wanted to know, what is the either exact or rough cost that we are charging to advertise on a single board? So it's $1,000 uh, pre-tax for 12 months. Okay. Um, which I think is very affordable and and, um, and is great uh, advertising for our small businesses in in Brampton. And so my follow-up question to that is, what are we doing to inform the businesses of this opportunity um, to advertise on these boards? So we have had a few, um, I would say, social media advertising pushes to promote the opportunity and we are planning to do a bigger advertising push of the program in July sort of to align with the sales period. Um, we do have our own rink board um, in the arenas promoting the opportunity. Okay great and I just asked that when that um, comes up that you swing it through me. I know a lot of small businesses that I will reach out to um, in the city um, to let them know personally of the opportunity and maybe the rest of council can also throw it up on our social medias just to get the word out. I think it's a great opportunity for small businesses. Um, so again, thank you both for the presentation. Thank you. And through the chair, sorry, I did forget, we, we did also include it in the uh, Brampton Entrepreneur Newsletter, just with your comment on small business. Thank you so much. Thank you, Council Keenan. Are there any other uh, speakers on this item online? Thank you. Thank you, Tara, for that great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. We have a motion moved by Councillor Pileshi to receive the presentation and staff report. All in favor, all opposed. Thank you. The motion carries. Our next item is 10.1.2, a staff pre presentation regarding the Center of Innovation request uh, for expression of interest, Ward 1. We also have a related staff report item, 10.2.8, which we, we can consider after the presentation. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning, Mayor and Council, staff and members of the public. I'm Melissa Key from the Office of the CAO, 
and I'm joined by Mike Sabo from Diamond Schmidt Architects. We're here today to present the expression of interest and design update for Centre for Innovation. Next slide, please. The CFI was conceived following the province's announcement to fund the TMU Sheridan University campus in downtown Brampton. In 2017, Council endorsed up to $100 million to create a state-of-the-art facility to support the university and provide an innovation and collaboration space. In 2018, staff proposed a current site east of George Street and south of Nelson and presented high-level scope. The city also launched a procurement process to retain an architectural firm. Later that year, with the change in government, the province announced they were withdrawing funding support for the universities, including the Brampton campus. Council decided to proceed with the CFI and approved an additional $30 million to increase the height by five stories. This was coupled with the direction to merge the CFI with the transit hub, which was later reversed in 2020. In 2021, Diamond Schmidt was selected to design and manage the facility construction and the city launched the procurement process to hire a construction manager. Last year, Council heard from University of Guelph Humber as well as Algoma University on their interest in the CFI. Council further heard from and supported Rogers Communications' request for MZOs, entailing a commitment of a $100 million investment to create a campus co-located with the downtown Brampton GO station. Presently, the design development for the CFI is complete and the latest budget estimate for the project is roughly $200 million. Next slide, please. The evolving context around the project, post-secondary interests, and the future of downtown Prempton, especially in a post-pandemic environment, might warrant further consideration. The unexpected pandemic has changed the way people go about working, learning, and collaborating, which in turn impacts the way space is occupied. The anchoring factor of leveraging the CFI to support the Ryerson Sheridan campus is no longer relevant. However, Ryerson, or TMU, is opening a medical school at the Civic Center site in 2025. Other post-secondary partners, including today, you heard from Algoma, have expressed interest in the CFI to expand their footprint. Rogers Communications $100 million investment, if comes to fruition, would transform downtown and the proposed location is just steps away from the CFI. And last but not least, the cost escalation from $130 million to $200 million imposes additional financial pressure on the city. With the uncertainty of Bill 23 and the increasing inflationary pressures in present years, the city would benefit from alternative funding sources to realize the vision of this project. Next slide, please. Staff proposes launching a request for expression of interest to seek innovative ideas and partnership models from prospective proponents on the possibility of the CFI as a catalyst to redevelop the downtown core in present context. The EOI would allow council the opportunity to consider proposed options while retaining the ability to continue with the existing project should proponents fail to present an attractive case. The EOI would follow the sequential steps highlighted on this slide, much akin to the existing process underway for other projects. The city would draft and launch an EOI with four to five weeks on the market. There will be a question and response period during this time for prospective proponents to clarify any information as required. Following that, a city evaluation team would assess the submissions against preset criteria. Proponents would be invited to make a presentation on their submissions. Finally, staff will report back to council on the submissions and the evaluation outcome for decision making. A fairness monitor and external consultants or advisors may be enlisted to support the process. Next slide, please. With respect to timeline, the EOI can be launched as early as May for about a month before proceeding with an evaluation process over the summer. Staff expects to report back in September or earlier with an assessment of the submissions for council consideration. And now I'll turn it over to Mike to walk through the current designs. Next slide, please. Thanks and good morning. Um, maybe we can jump to the next slide. 
So in the design of the project, um, there were really four key objectives that were driving our design thinking. The first was to make the CFI project impactful. And we see it uh, impactful being uh, it, it, it's a vehicle for innovation, it's a vehicle for economic uh, redevelopment, uh, it's an educational heart, and most importantly, it needs to be an iconic <coughs> reflection of the city of Brampton's aspirations. Go to the next slide, please. Um, secondly, uh, it needs to be connected and connected on a number of levels. Connected in terms of the, the urban form of the city, really bringing and knitting together the, the pedestrian environment to the core of downtown, um, creating a potential opportunity for an academic quad at, in the heart of the, of, of the city block. Um, next slide, please. And also, it needs to be a vehicle to connect com the, the community, potential academic partners, uh, and the broader community, something that really knits things together in a way that's uh, both supportive of the Brampton citizens as well as uh, academic partners. Next. And thirdly, it needs to be agile. Agile in order to uh, accommodate the changing needs of the community, accommodate changing needs of partners that the city of Brampton engages with, um, and do it in a way that brings people together into a social hub and a heart for the facility. Next. And lastly, it needs to be sustainable. It needs to be an exemplary facility for the city of Brampton. It needs to be resilient. It needs to be a low energy facility, a low carbon facility, and most importantly, a healthy facility. So we've been asked to also identify uh, opportunities within the existing, the current design. If we go to slide 12, please. Um, you'll see the, the current design is essentially a five story podium with a nine-story extension in the middle of the, the, the building, which is identified as a sort of tower element. Uh, if we go to slide 13, and sorry, that actually reflects roughly 250,000 square feet, just under. If we add uh, five stories on top of the tower portion, we can be at around 320,000 square feet in total area. Slide 14. We, if we had 10 stories on top of the tower, we can be around 390,000 square feet. And lastly, if we infill where the existing Nelson Street parking garage is, we can be just shy of 500,000 square feet. So roughly doubling the size of the current design without a, a, a major rethinking of the concept. Um, that's all we really have to present. Uh, if there's any questions uh, or comments. Thank you so much. We have Councillor Santos on the floor. Thank you through you. Mr. Chair, this is similar to the CAA situation where we're now trying to get things moving along. Um, I'm happy to receive the presentation and I'm very happy with the timeline that has been proposed in the report, which I, which I read um, early this morning. Happy to also move that we proceed with the expression of interest. If there's any further direction that you need, Marlon and team, please let us know. Okay, so happy to, to move all of it and really looking forward to seeing uh, what's coming in August. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have Deputy Mayor Singh, you have the floor. Yeah, uh, I just want to thank staff also for um, coming with this process for uh, the Center of Innovation. I just had a couple of questions. When we do expression of interest, we might have various uh, parties applying. And after the expression of interest is uh, the deadline has commenced, where, is there an opportunity to ask them to work together if we see significant overlap or synergies that make sense for them to combine or, or, or utilize space collectively? Is, is there gonna be opportunity at that point? Through the chair to uh, uh, Councillor Singh, are you talking during the open period or after it closes? Well, I'm assuming it open. They're not. Uh, do you expect them to do combined proposals at that point, or do you expect in the expression of interest, for example, we have two or three or four academic partners? It, they would all apply independently. I'm assuming in the expression of interest phase, but yeah. Um, 
So we're looking for innovative ideas and ways. If they get together and they submit a joint proposal, mm -hmm. that would be acceptable as well. Okay. okay. We would be evaluating that. And m maybe they wouldn't know each other as applying. Would there be opportunities after two to uh, see if we can work something out together? Because there's many iterations of this building that increase with size as well. So it might make sense to be like, hey, you only need 200,000. You need to, like, why don't we work together? More the merrier. The, uh, to the chair, to um, Councillor Singh, that's exactly one of the reasons why we, we're taking this route is because we're open to new ideas, new ways of looking at this project and looking at um, ultimately saving the uh, taxpayer the, the expense as well. So any new ideas, innovative ideas would be welcome, it would be evaluated, and we would uh, deal with it accordingly. Okay, so I'm hearing yes. Uh, yes, right? yeah. that's, the, <laughs> that's a long <laughs> answer, but yes. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure we were clear. Yeah, exactly. Um, just two li little points. I know these are very preliminary designs, but I noticed with the largest iteration, the green space went. <laughs> so maybe ensuring we do look at green roofs or whatnot, uh, uh, you know, to maintain some sort of green space because it looks beautiful with green space. Um, but, you know, there's many ways to make sure we have green space on roofs. I know it's just concept design, so I know we'll work that out uh, later. Secondly, um, I heard... We might hire a uh, fairness monitor. I would say we just take the exact same approach we did for the CA lands. I know we like to call it something else, not CA lands, but um, city lands, and just take the same approach, just copy and paste, really, in my eyes. Yeah. The poss uh, through the chair, the possibility exists that we would be using the exact same yeah. fairness yeah. monitor we had right now. Yeah. So that's why it was worded as hiring as yeah. opposed to using the same. Yeah, exactly, because yeah. um, I haven't had any complaints about that approach, yeah. and everybody seems to be happy, so we can do the same thing. But otherwise, it looks uh, like an exciting opportunity. Uh, my last thing is, so we have the expression of interest, and then is there, what's the, how do we distinguish that from our RFP phase? Like, how's this working? So we have expression of interest, then we work um, with the proponents, and then it can move straight to a joint agreement, or is there another process that has to come after the expression of interest? Uh, through the chair, after the expression of interest, if we identified one group or mm -hmm. or a, a consortium of sorts, yeah. we would then move to an RFP, uh, a phrase if we have more than one. Yeah. If we have one, we, we could move into um, direct negotiation. <laughs> okay, all right. And these. And these will be coming to council, correct? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, okay. All right, I'm good. Thank you. Uh, exciting, and we'll see what happens. Um, just the last, I know I've said last thing <laughs> twice, but this is really the last <laughs> thing. If we could take a similar approach in the set, we have a page dedicated to this, and we have some social media around this. I think just throwing a wide net out, um, you know, makes it look much more transparent, and I know we did that with the city-owned land, so just kind of similar approach with this. Uh, to the chair to Councillor Singh, we'll just duplicate that process. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I have a motion moved by Councillor Santos to receive the presentation and approve the staff report. All in favor? Opposed? Thank you. The motion carries. Uh, we have our next item is 10.2.1. Was it in consent? 10.2.2 in consent. 10.2.3 in consent, 10.2.4 consent, and we have 10.2.5, uh, sorry, 10.2.6, which is going to be deferred next week to council, 10.2.7 consent, and we have a staff report, Center for Innovation, re request for expression of interest, Ward 1. And we just did that right now. And I believe we have 10.4 correspondence. Our Three, next item is 10.5. That's correct. Councillor, qu uh, question period for this section. Do any members have any questions for this corporate section? Seeing none, we'll move on. Uh, 10.6, uh, public question period. Any questions online? There are none, uh, Chair Brar, and I don't see anybody 
present that wishes to ask a question. Okay. And I believe we are. And we will move on to item 13.1, which is the referred matters list. And this is the quarterly presentation of the referred matters list, uh, even though it's linked on every agenda. Um, unless there's any questions, there would just be a motion to receive the referred matters list for Q1. Do any members have any questions or comments regarding the referred matters list? Okay, thank you. I have a motion moved by Councillor Santos to approve the minutes. All in favor, all opposed. Thank you, the motion carries. Now we can deal with item 14, a public question period. And through you, Chair Brar, there are no questions online. I don't know if there's anybody present that wishes to ask a question regarding this recommendation made at today's meeting. There are Perfect. none. Our next item is um, item of business is 15, closed session business. I have a motion moved by Councillor Tour to Ch move. Chair Brar, so yes. that, that item was added to consent. Oh. So in doing so, direction was given to uh, provide the direction set out in the closed session report, which included a public motion. So there is one public motion uh, that we'll just bring up on the screen. Okay. This relates to a property lease matter, and it will just require a mover. Move by Councillor. Deputy Mayor Singh. We have a motion on the screen. All in favor? Opposed? The motion carries. Adjournment. Our last item of business is item 16. Adjournment committee is scheduled to meet Wednesday, March, oh, April 12th. April 12th, 9.30. I have a motion moved by Councillor Power to adjourn today's meeting. All in favor, all opposed, thank you. The motion carries. The meeting is adjourned.